Hmm. So we are doing um, the Healer and the Dreamer workshop number two called The Symbolic Language of Dreams. The Symbolic Language of Dreams. Um, it's interesting how uh, doing a workshop on, on astrology, a workshop series on astrology, the second workshop would be about um, the symbolic, symbolic language of dreams. The reason uh, for that is um, that um, uh, in my work uh, as an astrologer and in the healer and the dreamer technique that I teach, um, we use Carl Jung's uh, techniques of uh, dream interpretation in chart analysis. Uh, it's kind of the foundation um, in Jung's work Mm -mm. went deeply into how dream analysis works um, and how the world of symbols works. So he, basically, he, talk, he thought that um, there are two different types of relating to information or thinking. There is a rational thinking, which we're really familiar with in uh, our culture, and then there's symbolic thinking. And they're very, very different. Mm. Symbol, symbolic thinking is kind of like magical thinking, you know, where we, we see magic everywhere when we look at symbols. And when we look at things symbolically, we see um, magic everywhere. Um, and then when we think rationally, uh, then, you know, the human, you know, the human experience, the human, uh, you know, adventure, this uh, modern man uh, with the evolution of the human mind has kind of beaten out of um, his thinking, anything magical, anything symbolic, and, you know, now we, we have become very rational, very scientific. And so Jung applied scientific techniques to the world of symbols. And in his work with dream analysis, he developed into a science. Um, and, and so you have to understand Jung as a person. Jung started out getting some very, very powerful dreams very early on in his life. And he was moved by the dream world throughout his life, so much so that um, as a doctor, as a psychiatrist, as a scientist, as a researcher, uh, he was himself guided by the dream world. And he made a science out of healing with dreams. You know, so he started his career in a mental asylum in a... Um, in the Burgosi Mental Hospital, and he learned um, to work with uh, symbols, and he learned to work with people who were very ill uh, through dream analysis and through symbolic ana analysis, and he had a lot of success very early on in his career, and then as he left the mental hospital and started his uh, practice, he, he dealt more with uh, with you know, so-called normal people, but the same things that he saw in the dreams and the visions of his delusional and psycho, you know, psychologically ill patients, he saw these symbols in in you know healthier people, and he developed a science. You know, this is a man who, in his practice over the course of his practice, analyzed 90,000 dreams. So, you know, if you went to Jung and Jungian psychology is set on dreams. It is, it is a, a dream analysis uh, therapy. And so, through his work, he developed the science out of dream analysis. And now, as we are returning you know, we all feeling the need to return to a more symbolic life. We see that developing a dream practice 
can help us heal and adjust to our own inner uh, selves. So he developed the science of the dream work and, uh, and basically to our modern culture, he's advocating dream work as a spiritual practice. So in my effort in teaching astrology and in teaching uh, dream work, I, I look at these things as spiritual practices or practices like yoga or meditation or, you know, Tai Chi. We have practices that help us live a better life, you know, in our bodies, in our, in our soul, in our emotions, in our mind. We have these practices that we do to help us, um, you know, cope with the reality of living in, 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 in our modern society. So then dream analysis, dream work, and astrology are similar practices. They're practices that help us understand what lies in the deepest part of our soul. So Jung basically thought that, you know, neurosis, psychosis, problems of the psyche are caused because the two sides of the personality are not working in harmony. Um, so we have two sides of our personality, all of us as a masculine side, all of us as a feminine side. The masculine personality, conscious personality, a man as an unconscious that is of feminine nature. A woman as an unconscious that is of a masculine nature. He called those anima and animus. So my soul as a man is feminine, the, as a woman, your soul is masculine and we project these things. But in our society, we tend to, you know, rational thinking puts aside the unconscious part of the personality and becomes one-sided. And our society is very one-sided because of our rational thinking and our emphasis on rational thinking. We have lost the connection with, um, uh, with the magical. And, and, and so then Jung says that that other side of my personality, when it's ignore, ignored, it rises up against me and becomes my shadow. So then it starts haunting me. It starts, you know, so that's, you know, and so then we have issues, you know, that seem, that are shadow issues, but really, it's really our soul rising up against us, telling us, hey, you're not uh, paying attention to me. And so like a you know, spoiled child, he will uh, clamor for attention. So psychic disturbances are um, effects um, that um, are manifested because we are too one-sided as a person. Um, and so, so then, you know, so then these two concepts of the conscious personality and the unconscious, these are terms in Jungian psychology, scientific terms, talking about, you know, the symbolic side of the personality and the rational, you know, mo you know conscious side of the personality. So for Jung to reestablish health, you needed to have a dialogue between the two. And he said that the, the way the unconscious would talk to the personality, its main way would be to dream work. So then dream work becomes a, a, a therapy, a practice that helps us, helps us connect with the symbolic side of the personality. Um, and so, so, um, you want to hit the next line? Mm -hmm. Can I just ask you? Please. So, how is the animus anima, the male, female, how does that relate to people that are transgendered or somewhere in there, which, of course, Jung didn't have that in his time. At least it wasn't open. How does that work with those people? That's a very beautiful question. And uh, to me, um, you know, so, so, if you look at the at alchemy um, and even at the early Gnostics and in ancient times, um, the individual, 
uh, was known to be bisexual. In other words, I have a masculine side and a feminine side within me, right? And these things were understood in the past, and they were dealt with, you know, the sacred marriage, you know? So now these unconscious things, the unconscious ancient m models are rising up in our society from unconsciousness, and now people have this conception that they're both masculine and feminine, and that they can play whatever role. And in our society, we've become so advanced, in a sense, in a sense. Mm -hmm. that we can, even a woman can negate her feminine side and only become a man, you know, like a very, you know, corporate, you know, driven, you know, I don't want to have a family, you know, I don't cook, you know, and then you have men that stay home and take care of the babies. Yeah. So, in, you know, in our... In our modern thinking and in rational thinking, we've come to really um, come to a very fluid, you know, because when you do an analysis with somebody, it's not always that, you know, for a, a woman that the man is, is you know, the, the, the masculine side of the personality could actually be dominating the feminine part. And then, yeah, and then it's actually the feminine part of the, the woman that's asleep or unconscious. And you can have the same thing with a man where the, the, the feminine side of the personality is much stronger than the masculine and the masculine is unconscious. Mm -hmm. So then in those kind of situations, then it's, it's, for, it's really evident that you see people who, you know, identify with these things. Because already it's present even in a person that so-called normal you know, a woman can be very, very, very masculine and a man can be very, very feminine. And so it, it's kind of in this effort of, of, uh, of modernizing, uh, we have lost touch with uh, so many of the, of the natural phenomena of life and have redefined ourselves to be transcendent to these designations and yet, the confusion is probably greater than ever because we threw out all of the rules and now we're making up our own rules. And so how that masculine and feminine plays out in an individual has become very complex. It has. And, 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 and but it, it, does that answer your question? Yeah. yeah. Cool. So as physicians of the soul, we have to turn to the ancient art of dream interpretation. So we have to deal with men and women whose, this is perfect for your question, whose way of life is so individual that no counselor, however wise, can prescribe the way that is uniquely right for them. You know, because of all of this confusion, therefore we teach them to listen to their own natures mm. so that they can understand from within themselves what is happening. And so then in the language of the dreams, we get an indication of what part of myself is asleep and how it wants to come back. So before we go uh, much further into, 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 um, into, the, into dream analysis per se, we need to talk about symbols. What is a symbol to you? What is a symbol? Well, the cross would represent Jesus' crucifixion or yes. something like that. Exactly. Right? Right. A glyph that tells a story? Mm -hmm. A glyph? That tells a story. A glyph is a, glyph is a symbol. Yeah. And, you know, so like the cross. You know, the cross in itself, if you're a Christian, you'll get really motivated mm -hmm. by that. It will move you, you know? And, and there are other things uh, like... Um, like what, what happens when we look at things symbolically? When we attribute meaning to you something attribute that's either meaning? a graphic re representation or it could be something alive and like a bird flying across the water that synchronizes mm -hmm. with the moment you have a thought about your father. Exactly. Like mm -hmm. You make association. A association. You think symbolically. Mm -hmm. so, so dreams communicate that way. Astrology communicate that way. Religion, myths, uh, uh, archetypes. So, you guys familiar with the word archetypes? Mm -hmm. so, so, a symbol is how an archetype communicates. 
right? Mm -hmm. So you experience the archetype, you experience the myth through the symbol, so it has a numinous charge. It is, it, it, it is kind of an experience of the divine through the symbol, like the cross, like the mandala for the Buddhist. Um, you know, there are so many different symbols uh, and, um, you know, like the, the crescent moon is a symbol. So then we look at these symbols and we get affected. So use, uh, Jung used the, the word affect. It moves me. Emotionally, I'm affected by that, you know. And so then a, a symbol has an emotional, numinous charge to it. <clears throat> where it affects me deeply. And so that's the language of symbols. That's the language of the archetype. Does that make sense to you guys? You want to hit the next slide? So that's the two kinds of thinking, the rational and the symbolic. So the unconscious communicates through images and symbols. The numinous quality of the symbols, myths, fairy tales, all of these things... Uh, poetry, songs, they communicate with the language of symbol. And so it's very, you know, for someone that's very, very rational, we don't believe in symbolic language. But as, but in our day and age, we've been so rational in, in it has caused an imbalance in our society and now, as we are navigating these crazy times, we see that most, a lot of us are being drawn back to the symbolic world. And, and so then, then dream analysis and a dream practice can help me reconnect with that world, but I have to understand the language of symbol in order to understand dreams. You want to hit the next one? So it is a fact that symbols, by the very, their very nature, can so unite the opposites that these no longer clash, but mutually supplement one another and give meaningful shape to life. And then I like this one. In nature, the resolution of opposite is always an energetic process. She acts symbolically in the truest sense of the world, uh, word doing something that expresses both sides just as a waterfall visibly mediates between the above and the below. The waterfall itself is then the incommensurable third. <laughs> In an open and unresolved conflict, dreams and fantasies occurs which, like waterfall, illustrates the tension and nature of the opposites and thus prepares synthesis. So then what the, dream or what the dream does is it allows me to compensate or to understand what that part of myself that's unconscious wants to communicate so that we can have a harmony. So that this shadow, the, you know, this unconscious part that's being ignored, that's risen against me as my shadow communicates to me through my dreams and sometimes in very graphic ways, you know, you know, with a lot of numinous and effective charge so that I will pay attention to it. And as I pay attention to it, then it helps me heal and become more whole as a person. So then we can see the therapeutic and healing effect of dream work. And astrology works in the same way. Want to hit the next one? So, the role of dreams is compensation of the conscious attitude. So, in our conscious attitude, in our modern attitude, we have, you know, you know we've been trained from, from our school days to think in a particular way and to look at success. You know, we've been programmed. We've been developed. We've developed a certain way of thinking that is very one-sided. And we are learning to... And now we're realizing that that's created a huge shadow in our society, collectively, but also individually. And then dream analysis, the function of dreams is to rectify that imbalance. 
So by working, so then, then Jung talks about the role of dreams to compensate my conscious attitude. You know, so then as a spiritual practice, and it happened in Jung's life where he had throughout his life many, many, many dreams that helped him adjust his, con his, his, um, <coughs> his conscious attitude. Uh, his book, Memories, Dreams, and Reflections, is a fabulous book about his life story he told through his dreams, basically, and how the dream material of his life guided him to the ideas and at impasses in his life, he, was, he received dreams to guide his scientific work. And, uh, and, and, and then he made a science out of that, uh, out of working with dreams. So to compensate the conscious attitude, restoring the balance between conscious and unconscious, Illuminate the situation in a way that can be especially beneficial to help. So, in other words, if I have a problem, if I'm going through, you know, a tension, an inner tension, dreams will come that will help me, that will guide me in my, uh, in, in, in my, in my process. Oh. <clears throat> and so, so then paying attention to my dreams then becomes almost like a, a guide, a spiritual guide, where uh, I meet this spiritual guide in my dreams. And, and Jung made a whole art out of that. Mm. And, uh, uh, and we'll look at the Red Book a little bit later uh, to show you some of the things that he's come up through with his visions and his dreams. Dreams exert a remarkable influence on conscious mental life. Everybody who's had a powerful dream knows how moving a dream can be. You know, you get the, you know, and, and when the dream moves you, the more it moves you, the more meaning it has. And Jung called that an, an effect. It, you know, not effect, but effect. An effect is... You know, like when you have a really powerful dreams and you're crying or you're terrified or you're falling in love in your dream and you're like really moved by it, then um, that effect, that emotional effect, you wake up, you're scared, you know, or, or um, I had a dream once where um, um, a beautiful woman came into my dreams and we were hanging out and we're having a beautiful time and then she starts she gets up and she leaves and I says who are you and, and, and you know and she says I'm Hawthorne and then and then that acted at, I was having heart problems at that time and I was you know understanding more and so then Hawthorne, you know, Hawthorne is a medicine for the heart, you know, so then, oh, you know, so in a dream, you'll get guidance mm -hmm. like that. And as you take your dream seriously, you'll, you know, it will help you in your conscious mental life. The whole of a person's life experience may be contained in every dream. And, you know, so the dream material, although it doesn't look like my life, if I take the time to analyze all the symbols in it, it starts telling me my life story. And it's powerful, you know. You know, in, in astrology, what I do in my own, in my practice is I do chart analysis. I, you know, people ask me to, 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 to read their charts, their astrological charts. And, um, they, um, and so I ask them to keep a dream journal. And then I'll read their charts, and then at the end of the reading, I will read the dream, and the dream will confirm the reading, and will basically tell the life story in a in a different in in, in apparently a different way. But if we submit the, the the dream to analysis, it tells the same story as the as the chart analysis. So then. Then, then that really leaves a person with a strong uh, sense of <coughs> what is going on in their dreams. So how, how does that, are you going to talk about maybe later on at some point about prophetic dreams? 
Absolutely. Okay. You're, uh, you're like one step ahead of me. <laughs> so purposive orientation. It, you know, sometimes Jung would get dreams that would help him orient himself. Like um, I, had a, I had a dream um, um, last fall where I was on a boat with the with the with the with the, my friend Zach, who was the captain of the boat, and um, and uh, it was a stormy night, and we we're on the coast, and it was really really stormy, and the sun was setting, and you know, and then and then Zach said, uh, "Okay, we're gonna anchor down, and I'm going to bed." I said, "Woo!" <laughs> <laughs> like no way. And then, and then, and then he says, yeah, it's going to be fine. Don't worry. I'm going to bed. See you in the morning. So then, then in the dream, I took a little boogie board, you know, a little half surfboard. And I sat, I, I went on this boogie board and I went into the, into the stormy ocean, but I was feeling very safe. And then I was paddling and the sun was setting and it was beautiful and waves were going and it was like really stormy, but I was fine. And then the most epic of waves, like, you know, like the, the kind of waves that the dream, the surfers dream about, you know, massive wall of water is coming and it's going to break on me. And I think, oh, that's it. <laughs> and, but still, I'm not afraid. And the wave breaks right before me instead of right on top of me. And... And, and then it carries me into this milky foam and it's a great ride and I'm having a lot of fun. And another wave comes sideways and throws me up way in the air. And I'm way, way, way up in the air. And I land back down into the water. And no fear, no stress, not drinking any salt water or anything. And that's when I woke up. And so, so then we analyzed and worked on this dream and there are different parts of it and we can look at it a little bit later as you become more familiar with the techniques. But uh, this part of being thrown way up in the air, I worked with that and I worked with that. First of all, I was thinking, oh, you're becoming inflated and you're thinking too much of yourself. Mm -hmm. then, a, then a friend helped me realize that actually I needed to take to the airwaves. And so now we, you know, now we started a website and we have a YouTube channel and recording these. And so, so that was, that provided really important information in, on my journey. And so then it, it's purposive. Mm -hmm. I'm at a crossroad. I don't know really what to do. I put some intention into my dreams. I listen to my dreams. My dreams become my guide. They become the voice of the unconscious. Kind of exciting, huh? Mm -hmm. You want to hit the next slide? I call dreams compensatory because they contain ideas, feelings, and thoughts whose absence from consciousness leaves a blank, which is filled with fear instead of with understanding. Isn't that a beauty? Um, so, so, so... This tension between the conscious and the unconscious, the unconscious tries to get attention of the conscious. The unconscious tries to get attention through emotions like fear. Like, you know, when we experience fear or when we experience inner tension, anxiety, you know, sleepless nights. That's the way of the unconscious to try to get my attention. And so... So then, so then if we focus on our dreams and our practices, then we can mm -mm, replace the fear with what the actual message from the unconscious is. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah, the next one. Okay, so that, and, and then this one is really nice too. It talks about how, actually it's a little bit ahead. You wanna hit the next one? Mm -hmm. I redid all my slides today and types of dreams. So we're going to go through the different types of dreams and then we're going to go through the techniques of dream analysis and then we'll look at some, then we'll start looking at some material, um, dream material. So how are we doing so far? Great. Do we have any questions? 
Mm -hmm. You know, from my shaky beginning, we're doing better, huh? <laughs> um, great. Just, all good. I, I used to have fantastic epic dreams, but I don't anymore. So I want them back. <laughs> I don't know what to do to get them back. It, it's a setting intention. You know, so setting intention when you go to bed, you know, pray for a dream. Yeah. You know, do a, a little rituals. You know, some uh, thing you can do is, do, do you do smudge? Do you smudge? Yeah. So you smudge your bedroom, you know, saying, you know, I really want to. Then as soon as you get a little snippet, write it down. Keep a dream journal. I used to, yeah. Uh, yeah. I don't want to wake myself up. I have enough problems sleeping, so. <laughs> well, the, but the, the, you, do you take sleeping medicine? I used to. Okay. And now I do it at times herbal stuff but I think it's because of the severe severe challenges I've gone through in the past few years it's kind of wiped it out or something I feel like it's just gone for now my, my psyche's on hold or something well uh, my sense is that you're here because it's waking up and I think that as you uh, we're gonna talk about more practices and just the fact that you're here you know I, I call it priming the pump Oh, you good. know, I hope so. You know, you get to a point where oh, I just got to dig a little deeper, and prime the pump and get it going again. And once the pump gets going, then uh, and with the tools that I'm going to teach you tonight, um, you're going to start working with your dreams again. So big dreams and little dreams. So there are dreams that you know that seem, you know, all dreams are important and you need to work with all of them. You know, and so, so it's not that in the little dreams we get messages, we don't get messages, but in the big dreams, usually at the beginning, you know, when, when, the, when you come to a, do a reading or when you come to, um, to do some deep work, usually the night before, you know, like I tell my clients, you know, use, and, and Jung used to do the same thing. He says, well, you know, going to come and see me, pay attention to your dreams. And usually you expect it always that the night before the beginning of analysis, a big dream would come. Something with a lot of effect, you know, it would be really moving and it would be very, you know, mysterious and moving to the individual. And so we look for those kind of dreams, those big dreams that say something. Subjective and objective way to work with dreams. This is really important um, because we can look at dreams in a Freudian kind of way, which is very uh, uh, subjective. You know, I saw somebody yesterday and I went to this store and then now, you know, I met them in the store, in the same store in my dream. So that's why. You know, so we look at the very subjective ways of understanding our dreams, very superficial, you know, or we associate the dreams with, uh, you know, with just ordinary mundane event. You know, so looking at a dream from a subjective, no, that's an objective way. And then the subjective way is... Um, to see that everything in the dream represents me or part of me and that the dream has a purpose. It's trying to tell me something about my own process. So we can look at it objectively, you know, and thinking that, you know, this is what it means on the outside, you know, or, you know, you know, I fell in love, in my dream, I fell in love with so-and-so, and so tomorrow I'm going to call him and we'll have a date, you know? Or, you know, so that's an objective way of looking at a dream, or subjective way means I fell in love with somebody in my dream, okay, that's my masculine soul, or that's my feminine soul trying to tell me something, what is, he what is my masculine soul, what my feminine soul is trying to tell me? So then it's everything in the dream is subjective. It relates to me. Reductive, product, prospective, anticipatory, telepathic, and perfective. So reductive, it reduces. I think of myself really highly. 
So the dream takes me back a couple of notches, you know, makes me realize, you know, like when I first started working with that dream where I was thrown up in the air, I thought, oh, I'm starting to think too much of myself. So I thought the dream was trying to bring me back down to earth. You know, so, so it reduces. Perspective means it announces some development that's coming up. Anticipatory, you know, same thing, kind of. Telepathic, <coughs> like uh, Jung had a dream and he woke up in the middle of the night and he wrote the time. And it was a very moving dream and he wrote the time and he wrote it down. And the next day, he found out at that exact moment, his friend has died. You know, so then you have telepathic and prophetic dreams. Mm -hmm. Just like uh, before, World, uh, before World War II, Jung kept seeing in people's dreams huge, huge rivers of blood. He saw it in his own dreams. And, and he thought he was going crazy. You know, and he saw it in his dreams. And then World War II came out. And then he realized, oh, you know, prophetic. So how to work with the different types of dreams? It takes a while. You get to learn how to do it um, through uh, practice. But those are the different types of dreams. The next one. Oh, can I yes, ask you? Please. With the reductive, that's, you were saying that that uh, takes you down if you're thinking too much of yourself. Is there an opposite? Absolutely. What is, it hmm? what is it called? Uh, I um I don't know. Um, uh, uh, reductive. Mm -hmm. and, uh, um, I think that that's the perspective. Okay. It, it you know it, it shows prospect. It shows it shows you a way. You know so it, it it encourages you in a particular way versus taking you down. It encourages you. You know flying dreams are really. You know flying dreams are like you know. Like you're dissociated and usually, you know, you're coming crashing down, you know, so, 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 so all, you know, there are different, you know, motifs and dreams and they're all very individual and need to be analyzed and we'll talk about how you analyze a dream here pretty shortly, actually right now, techniques <laughs> of dream work. So what, so, so when you look at a dream, so a dream comes in, you know, so... So, first question you ask is, what is the purpose of this dream? What is the unconscious trying to tell me about this dream, right? So, what's the purpose? Then, you, amplification. Amplification and free associations are the two most simple techniques. Last week we talked about free association. Free association, so we talked about how Jung, in his early career, worked with, um, with you know, with, um, with table turning and with uh, Ouija board, and then he got into hypnosis, learned hypnosis, and, 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 and did hypnosis with his clients, and then developed this technique called free association which he developed an association test and he would make a list of words and he would look at the word, he would look at the reaction of the person and so basically Jung would say a word and the person would react and he would measure the amount of time that it would take them to react and how they would react and what the word would say. And as he went through the whole process, of the hundred words that he would give them, he would see, okay, that, that, and that are the problem places, and he would say, oh, you have a mother complex, <laughs> you know? And so then, so then the free association, he developed that, and then so, so then we do the same thing. We, we take the symbols in the dream. So the dream proposes itself. You know, here's my dream. So. So the first thing in dream analysis is you got to write them down. So you wake up the first thing in the morning or you have a little book next to your table and you have a big dream, you write it down. You write it down and then you take one symbol after the other. 
And as you take that symbol, you amplify it. You make it really big. And then you free associate with it. Hmm. Till a numinous experience comes in. Till you become moved. Oh, that's what that's saying. Mm -hmm. So that's the free association and the amplification. Um, uh, and of course, you, you know, so then... Then your dream journaling and your dream sequence becomes the guide where, because we can take one dream and we can analyze it, but if we're wrong, the next dream will correct us. So then in dream analysis, it's not so much that we work with one dreams. In, but we have a constant engagement with our dreams where we're keeping track of our dreams, we're journaling them, and each dream uh, tells us about... Uh, you want to return to that one slide that I passed? Mm -hmm. Oh, whoa, you went fast. That one? Whoa, no, you missed it. Oh, yeah. Ah! <laughs> okay, I dream... No, no, back... This phenomena is a kind of developmental process in the personality itself. At first, it seems that each compensation, each dream, is a momentary adjustment of one-sidedness or an equalization of disturbed balance. But with deeper insight and experience, these apparently separate acts of compensation arrange themselves into a kind of plan. They seem to hang together in the deepest sense to be subordinate to a common goal so that a long dream series no longer appears as a senseless string of incoherent and isolated happenings but resembles the successive steps in a planned and orderly process of development. I have called this unconscious process spontaneously expresses itself in the symbolism of a long dream series, the individuation process. So individuation, in the next, uh, next week's workshop is on individuation, the quest for the self. So individuation is a word that uh, Jung used, created to talk about the process of self-development, of the process of uniting the two sides of the personality. That's called individuation, and the dream sequence maps out that process of individuation so that I have a barometer, I have a map, I have a guide, and it's my dreams. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Ian, how are you doing, man? I'm tired. <laughs> <laughs> you look so pensive. Yeah. <laughs> You, 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 you've seen this workshop before. No, no, no? not this one. No. How is this? Is this good for you? Keep going, I guess. Keep going, <laughs> I guess. Okay. So I'm interested more in the techniques myself. Okay. Yeah. So the only techniques that you use is amplification and free association. Yeah. Then the dream sequence and the dream journaling. Do you want to get the red book, please? Can you, ex can you mm -hmm. explain amplification again? I think maybe I missed that. Amplification is like, okay, so, so let's go back to my dream of being on the boat with my friend that's the captain. My friend is a master mechanic, but he's also a really good friend where we share the process of individuation together. Um, so, so, so I'm in this, say, you know, so I need, it's a stormy night. And he says, I'm going to bed. So then you amplify that. First, you amplify the boat. And then the captain. You know, so what is the boat? Well, the boat is my container. It, oh, you, okay, you know, okay. and the captain's going to bed during a storm. Close reading, as we would say. What's that? Makes me think of the term close reading from academia, you know. Close take, reading. Take a little concept and break it apart. Amplify. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so Jung called that amplifying. Okay. So you make it big. So when I looked at the boat and I looked at the captain, I thought, oh, 
the, the safe masculine vehicle, mm. you know, that I'm becoming more confident with my masculine side that, yeah, no problem, I'm going to bed. You know, so I took that, oh, you know, and then, and then I took the boogie board and I went into the water. So then, what is that? It's a little piece of foam, you know, <laughs> where I'm going out into the big ocean, stormy night. So I amplified that and amplified that. And to me, it was leaving my safe container when I was living and living in my van for months on end. I was going on my little surfboard, right? So, 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 so that's a perfect way, you know, and it's a storm brewing, you know, and then what, what, so if you amplify the ocean, what do you get? Let's put it on the table. And then <laughs> That's it. That's it. We'll go through it a little bit later. So what would you free associate? What would you, you know, so the free association and the amplification go together. You know, once I got the, the safe masculine boat, I was ready to move on. You know, okay, I got it. You know, the boogie board. Ah. You know, I'm having the courage to go in my van, and going on. Feeling very comfortable. Hmm? Feeling very comfortable. And safe yeah. on the ocean. So then if you amplify the ocean and free associate, what do you get out of that? Water well, always means emotions to me. Emotions? And also it would be expansive because it's the ocean and it would be unpredictable. Mm -hmm. Right. Unpredictable, mm -hmm. expansive, yeah. you know, emotions. Mm -hmm. Deep. Deep, also the feminine, the, feminine, mm -hmm. the mother. Yeah. You know, I took it as the great mother. I'm on the arms of the great mother and I feel safe, which is very different. Usually in that kind of a scene in previous time, I would have been terrified, naturally terrified of the ocean. Whenever I had dreams like that, I end up drowning. But no, here I am on the little boogie board <laughs> and I feel completely safe. And then I get the big wave. So then you free associate, you amplify that, and then you free associate. What's the big wave? Uh, <laughs> big, up. big, ch up. big change, Chaos. big mass of energy. <laughs> Something's happening, you know. And then the cross waves, and they're being thrown up in the air. So higher then, perspective. I see that as a higher perspective. So then, the, the situation was e exactly. Mm -hmm. And so, as I work with the dream, it just told me my whole life story mm -hmm. and what I needed to do. You, you know, take up. You know, there is a big wave coming. You're gonna ride that wave, and you got to take your stuff up into the air. Yeah. You know. You know. So, so does that make sense in terms of amplification? Amplify, free associate. Then be familiar with the myths and symbols of fairy tales of all cultures. Mm -hmm. uh, Jung had a very, um, a very interesting client where he was having a real hard time understanding her dreams. And, and again, if you went to Jung for, for, for analysis, you would bring your dreams and you would continue coming and bringing your dreams, all the dreams that would come and you would work with them and he would help you work with your dreams and then gradually help you heal. <clears throat> so, your, your neurosis. And so, so he was getting these really weird, really, really weird symbols in the dreams, which he did not understand. And he thought the whole thing was not going really well. And he thought of ending it. And the lady said, no, 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 we're doing really, really well. And then he got a book from a friend that talked about the Kundalini. And then he says, whoa, that's the same symbolism that she's been bringing me. And so then he found out that this lady, when she was a child, grew up in India and she had a, a nanny who nursed her and raised her who was East Indian. 
And he says, I don't know how she got it. She sucked it out of the breast or whatever, but all the dream symbolism was all from that time. And it was all related to the process of the Kundalini Yoga. And then once they understood that, she had a breakthrough and he had a breakthrough. So understanding where the person comes from and understanding the mythology and the myths, you know, so, so when you, dream, you know, do dream analysis with a person, you should be familiar with the heritage of the person. Somebody's Celtic, you will see Celtic motifs show up in the dreams. You'll see, you know, so, so, so then becoming familiar with symbols of all cultures becomes a really, really important aspect of dream analysis. Um, so then the dialectic approach, and this is really the most important part of dream analysis, is to not rely on your techniques and your tools so much but to realize that the process is dialectic. What did he mean by that? Meaning that you cannot sit above, think that you have all the answers to a dream and to say, I know what that means. And here's what it is to your client. You have to come down to the person's level and you have, because really it doesn't matter if you understand and you think you may understand, but really it's about the other person that you're helping. If they understand, if they have the realization, if they get it. And so then your job is only to guide that process till they get it. So the dialect approach is, is very difficult because as an analyst, you got to throw all your knowledge away and go to the process of being human and being present emotionally with the person and understanding and asking, how does that feel? You know, and you may suggest, well, that feels like that to me, you know, but no, it doesn't matter what it feels to you. It is, you know, and that process is really difficult because it puts you in a very vulnerable position and it also is very transformative, not just for your client, but for yourself as well. So the dialectic approach is really important. So then Jung said, okay, so what's the purpose of my dream? I amplify, I free associate, I creep a dream sequence, I journal my dreams. I study, you know, mythology, symbols, fairy tales, all cultures. I'm always fascinated with understanding the symbolic language. I use the dialectic approach. And then he says, okay, now you've had your dream material. Now you perform active imagination. You take that dream and you write about it. And you tell a story. You write a poem. You make some art. You, uh, you know, you do some music, you know, there's uh, Martha Graham. You guys know Martha, Martha Graham? She's a famous dancer. Um, the dancing school, Martha Gra Gra Graham, Gra Gra anyway, I'm not pronouncing it well, but uh, Martha Graham developed a whole dance school from active imagination. Um, so it's, you know, so you can, you can dance your dream, you can sculpt your dream, you can do pottery with your dreams. So then what you're doing is you're giving imagination a free range to express the intent of the unconscious. So now you're using the dream material to guard your creative process. Mm -hmm. And so that's what uh, Jung did in the Red Book. So in the Red Book, he took his dreams and visions and then he started writing. You know, so then he would take his dreams and visions and he would make art out of it. And so he did all of this, all the calligraphy and all the paintings by hand. And incredible expression of the unconscious. And, and a very symbolic language. Paintings like that. 
that were that came through in his dreams. No, a chair is perfect. It holds the book. Mm -hmm. You know, so the cosmic M. A little bit back again. So, so the, the, the red book was inspired from his visions that he got in his dreams. And through the process of working with the dream into making art, he developed his whole psychology from that. This is at a point where he broke down from, from Freud and started uh, this process of active imagination. So he experienced with it in his dreams, Philemon came. And Philemon became his spiritual guide and told him all kinds of things and he wrote it down in the book and then later on in his life he took those ideas and adapted them and discovered them in alchemy and so and he talks about this time as the most important creative time you know where he was engaging so so his whole thinking and his whole ideas, ideas developed as he was working himself with his dreams. And then he made a science out of it. And, and it's very simple, um, but yet sublime in how he mapped it out. And so we have, then we have theurgy. Theurgy means that then my dreams start becoming a spiritual relationship. Just like in, in, you know, in Philemon, um, Philemon became his guide and he had, you know, he had a relationship with Philemon as if Philemon was his spiritual master. And he showed up in his dreams and he kept coming. And, and then so then rituals, ceremonies, prayers, just like um, in a, you know, young when he was really young at all kinds. And we can talk about his dreams uh, as we move along. But um, had, um, had visions and dreams that couldn't have come. Like, a, like he had um, um, this little practice that he did when he was seven years old. Is he carved a little um, ruler into a little mannequin and got a matchbox and put, it, and put a cloth and put him in this matchbox. And, and, and put in a secret place and would bring him little stones on a regular basis as kind of food for this little <laughs> mannequin, okay? And that was all inspired just like that as a child's play. 50 years later, he was in Africa and he saw the same, you know, not 50 years later, but 35 years later, he was in Africa and he saw the native Africans doing the same thing. You know, so, so, so then buying, by, so, so what Jung said is that by giving free reign to the unconscious and by giving a voice to the unconscious, you are able to integrate, to give it a voice and you develop a spiritual kind of relationship with the unconscious, you know, through dream work. And, and it's a far... It's a far out idea that, that you know, in, in, in early cultures, in indigenous cultures, the shamans would have dreams that would guide the tribe. And so that's basically what Jung brought back is a way of spiritual guidance, of a spiritual relationship. That's why if you're not having any dreams, pray for them, ask for them, ask for guidance. And then pay attention and keep working at it, and dreams will come. And then you'll, you know, you'll, you know, prime the pump. Want to hit the next one? Mm -hmm. How are we doing? Awesome. Good. Awesome. Mm -hmm. Any questions? So each, everybody's symbol. There's the, the symbol symbology for everybody. Sort of general symbology, like maybe a hammer or something or whatever, but but to the individual, it still could mean something different. Absolutely. Right? Yeah, even though everybody says, well, that's what that means. But yeah, that's interesting. Um, it does mean different things then. Well, and that's why the amplification, and see, it could mean something to me, 
But if I use the dialectic approach, I'm looking to find out what it means to you. Well, you for instance, if you have great feelings, like being up in the air, I've had flying dreams and I'm, I just feel so liberated. I love them. Or going through walls. Right. You know, buildings, I just love that. I love it. So, so let's take, let's take, let's take um, a symbol like that. You know, going through a wall. What would that symbolize? What would the wall be? Well, it's a concrete structure. A concrete structure, something that you can't pass through. Yeah, that's right. A block. A what? A block. You know, it's yeah, a, it's yeah. blocking With the you. the physical body. It's a block from the yeah. physical body. It's a, you know, it's a wall. Literally, it's a wall. Yeah. You know, when we find a wall in our life, yeah. and you're going through the wall, so then what would that symbolize? Well, that you've gone through it. <laughs> that you're going, you, that, that there's resolution. some obstacles that are presenting themselves, and you have the ability to go through it. Mm. Or, you know, and... You resolve it, something. Exactly. And depending on the whole dream, as you subject the dream to analysis like that, you're going to get some insight. So it seems to me like we should get into it. Um, this is a beautiful long quote. Um, For the practical work of dream analysis, we need a special knack, an intuitive understanding on the one hand, and a considerable knowledge of the history of symbols on the other. As with all practical work of psychology, mere intellect is not enough. One also needs feeling, because otherwise the exceedingly important feeling values of the dream are neglected. Without these, dream analysis is impossible. As the dream is dreamt by the whole man, it follows that anyone who tries to interpret dreams must be engaged as a whole man too. Understanding and knowledge there must be but they should not set themselves up above the heart, which in turn, oops, editing, in turn, must not give way to sentiment. All in all, dream interpretation is an art, difficult, but capable of being learned by those whose gift and destiny it is. So, you know, it's interesting as you work with the Jung's work, you know, you look for dream analysis, and there are a few essays here and there throughout his 18-volume collected works that deal with it. But there's no place in particular that only talk about dreams. And yet, throughout his work, whenever he's talking about something, he will bring up somebody's dreams, or he'll bring up dream analysis, or he'll bring up a personal dream that helped them realize that. And so that throughout his work, he got bits and pieces of dreams. And it's really what made his work so significant is that he allowed himself to be guided by his dreams in the process of developing his practice. And, you know, he was practicing and he left a major imprint. This is a man who, who, who you know, who left a great imprint on our culture and who had a huge effect on the collective when he was alive and still today we live with a lot of the concepts that he gave us um, that we take for granted uh, but um, that are uh, a legacy that is very very important and all of that came through his work with dreams so um, and and again this is a scientist and a doctor and a psychiatrist and, and a pro prolific writer so so um, dream analysis is very important. We can get into, what's the next slide? Oh, I love this one. Treatment by dream analysis is an eminently educational activity whose basic principles and conclusions would be of the greatest assistance in curing the evils of our times. And then this one, nice too. It might be better to look upon dreams as being in the natures of works of art instead of mere observational facts for the scientist. The first view, seems, first view seems to yield better results because it is nearer to the essential nature of dreams. And this, after all, is the main point, that we make ourselves aware of our unconscious compensation and thus overcome the one-sidedness and inadequacies of the conscious attitude. 
And this is all from the development of personality. The development of personality is one of the most important accessible work that he gave us. Um, blah, 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 blah. Next slide. Okay, so then there's some archetypes and dreams, and we can talk about that. But how are we feeling? Do we need a little break? Right. So, so, so this is a. So I told you about this mannequin and stone fire rituals, and then I'm going to tell you about you know. So the red book we looked about, and I'm going to tell you about the sermon of the dead. So at the end of that book, sermon to the dead. To the dead thank you. Um, this actually it's the seven sermons to the dead, and it's at the end of memories, dreams, and reflections as an appendix. Good. So, so, and he tells the story in Memory, and Dreams, and Reflections. And if you are really interested in, in dreams, reading Memories, Dreams, and Reflections is a great introduction to Jung's work, but it's also a great introduction to dream analysis. Because <coughs> he goes over all of his dreams in there in a very significant way. Um, so, <clears throat> the thing is, you know, and then sometimes this question comes up, you know, and what is the difference between daydreaming and night dreaming and as you work with your dreams and you become more and more you're gonna have dreams in your waking life mm -hmm. you know where you know where the dream world the unconscious will actually communicate with you you know so they're called visions or you can call them channeling or you can call it so you know automatic writing so, he was sitting at his desk writing. You know, Jung had a large family, five kids, wife, you know, servants, maids, and a big house. Uh, mm, 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 mm. His wife was really wealthy, so they, they were living very well. And so he um, was writing at his desk, and from his desk he could see the front door. And the bell, bell rings, but there's no one there. The maid goes to the door to answer, no one's there. The bell rings again. The bell rings again, and then he could feel the whole house was crowded with ghosts. Oh, you got a sugar. <laughs> <laughs> then he heard this voice. We've come from Jerusalem, and we didn't get the answer we wanted. He went straight to his writing desk and he started writing. Whenever the ghosts and then the procession stopped right away. And the night before, all the kids had ghost visitations. You know, and it, the whole atmosphere in the house was super tense. Soon as he started writing, they were all, they all left. And for three nights in a row, he wrote. And the seven sermons of the dead came just dictated hmm. through the, by the ghosts. And he didn't publish that till he says, I don't want this published till after I die. <laughs> why, not? And, uh, why not? No, that, that, that is the same thing. But the seven sermons of the dead is uh, something that he included in Memories, Dreams, and Reflections. But he didn't intend the Red Book to be. Probably didn't want um, people to talk about him that he was crazy. Uh, I'm pretty sure it'd be something like that, or invalidate him, you know. So well, y you have to understand Jung's life. He was always fighting the label of mystic, you know, and and he always wanted to be known as an empiricist and a scientist. There was a tremendous mystical part to his work, oh, yeah. but he was a scientist first and foremost. And he didn't want to lose that reputation. And he didn't want to lose that practical. And, and we'll, we'll talk about it some, but, but, but that, that act of, of, of automatic writing, right? So that's what we're trying to do with the dream content, is we get our dreams, and then we allow whatever came into my dreams, we, we give it a voice. We allow it to write. We shut off our conscious mind and we listen to the unconscious and we write. And we write. You know, and so, and then what comes out of it surprises us. 
And now we learn, you know, the technique of, uh, you know, so then active imagination, automatic writing, channeling, these are all giving the unconscious a voice. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. In, in uh, just as a side note, and I think we talked about this last time, is what happens when um, you're, uh, you know, you know, you know, you're you're channeling or you're you're doing all of this work and you're giving the unconscious a voice, and you're going crazy, you know, and and really it's the same thing. You know, a peak experience, a peak experience, and going nuts is the same thing. It's the relationship that we have with the unconscious that makes it channeling versus being possessed. So he says that in a relationship with the unconscious, we have to have an objective engagement in other words we have to realize that no I'm not gifted no I'm not a prophet I'm just allowing this I'm having a relationship with the unconscious in which I am a servant to the unconscious I'm a servant to nature and nature is talking through me it's not me I don't own it to myself versus taking it and allowing to be possessed by it and to think that God is speaking through me, then I become possessed, I become a messiah, I become the leader, you know? And so Jung says that he always, he says, when dealing with the unconscious, you maintain an objective relationship with the unconscious. You maintain who you are as a human being versus and realizing that you're only a voice for the unconscious you know so so he always resisted Mary Louise von Franz says this about Jung's work is that he could have thought himself to be you know you know anybody who you know goes to the depth of the human soul he could have started a religion you know a lot of people try to get him to start a religion you know, a lot of people tried to, uh, sh you know, tell him that he was, you know, and a lot of people were gathered around him, and he always rejected the projection. He says, you know, I'm only, I'm only human, and I'm only working through my stuff, and no, I'm not going to take it on. You go work out, you develop your own relationship, here, you know, with, with the unconscious. And so, so, so to become possessed by the unconscious and to identify with the unconscious is the same thing, you know, in the mental asylum, the guy thinks he's Jesus Christ, you know, and then, and then I have a vision or something like that, and I think this is the truth, versus being objective about it, and I'm just expressing what the unconscious has to say, and I maintain my individuality. That was Jung. He was a scientist through and through. He didn't allow... You know, anybody who did something like that, or he did seven sermons of the dead, or, you know, collect, you know, 18, you know, incredible work, 18 volumes of, of incredible work. He didn't allow himself to think, you know, he didn't, he, you know, he resisted inflation and being possessed by the archetype versus, you know, and we see, you know, people who are possessed by an archetype, possessed by the unconscious, they think they've become a shaman. They think they've become something, but they're but it's the unconscious that is possessing them, and they don't actually live that. Yeah. She was first. Nancy I was, just was first. Gonna say it's like being a conduit. Exactly, yeah. a, conduit a conduit versus thinking that I am the Messiah. Right. You know, or you know, and it's very different. Yes. Yes. yes but what if what if the purpose of of, of um, allowing the the archetype to fully take over, you know, provides you with some sort of transcendental experience uh, that is also maybe like a religious experience because the transcendental religious experience, I mean, there are similar things. Um, so so young was that was resisting 
the transcendental experience. No, no, he was he, he was experienced the transcendental experience. He was objective about it. Mm -hmm. He was scientific he did, about he it. He chose not to lose himself in, in, in the it. chaos yeah. because he was, he was exactly why. He didn't let Why? His ego Be override. Because he would have gone nuts. Well, because he was, yeah, but who says he would have gone nuts? And for how long? He says it himself. He, he says it himself. But who has he done that and not gone nuts? But maybe he has. He was fearful of not being able to come back. And so this is a man who worked with crazy people all his life. <laughs> he knows more. You know, he know. He knew that territory so well. And he knew that he could... Uh, Playing with uncharted territory. Like, yeah, okay, so it's risky. It's risky business. It's very risky business. <laughs> it's <laughs> the most it's risky business it's, oh, in I every know. tradition, I, I, every uh, system. You're right. It, 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 yes. I'm just, I'm more, it was a curiosity about his, like, it, his, like, He's such a fascinating. He's such a fascinating man, and the what? more you study him, the more fascinated you're going to become. He's, you know, he's far out. Go ahead. I was just saying, I feel like everything, in especially in our limited duality perspective, has that duality. So when he said that, I got triggered too. In a way, I was like, well, what is he yeah. like? What's resistance? But then you see, after he passed, that is the wave that came after. It was like he is seen as this maybe not inflated ego, or maybe, but just like um, somebody who is able to kind of have that transcendental experience despite the fact that if you study his work more deftly personally from people who knew him or his actual work, mm -hmm. it seems like that was not his projector. He was not his true intention the whole time. But because it has a flip side, I feel like that's what's come after his passing. Well, <laughs> at many, many times in his life, he thought he was going to go into full-on psychosis. Yeah. And, 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 and he was at that doorway many, many times, and he documented it scientifically, and he arrives at really, in, you know, incredible, you know, especially if you start reading his spiritual work, like his commentary on, you know, his psychology and religion, and his understanding of the mass, and his understanding of the Tibetan books of the dead, and all, you know, I mean, this is, in, you know, obviously a man who went you know to that place and who experienced that but who I didn't but who was objective about it who saw it as a scientific study and just like he had a dream actually it was a near-death experience he left his body he was leaving his body I think I told that story last time mm -hmm. he left his body landed on the thing and then he was gonna go and he was gonna find out all of his answers and then his doctor comes in and says, oh, sorry, you're not ready to go yet. You know, and so, 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 you know, so he always looked at that objectively. That his job was to comment. And then we can look at some of his dreams, but I think we're digressing. Let's go back to the subject of dreams. Um, how are we doing on, on, on dreams? And do we have any questions about practical? And we should work with some material we can work with some of his material. We can some work with our own personal material. I can offer some of my own personal dreams. How are we doing? Mm -hmm. Good. Yeah, yeah. Do, um, just thinking, just because of recent dreams, um, dreams that kind of seem to jump from different places and things that they kind of just like suddenly flip into something mm -hmm. completely different. Mm -hmm. Is, did he talk about that at what do you all? Mean? We like say you're in a specific place with certain people and then the next second it's like you're in a completely different place different people different storyline but they seem somewhat connected but they're not like they seem I just had a client like that who came to me with a dream with three different parts completely unrelated mm -hmm. and then you work through it same. and then they were all related and they all told the same story and at the end of it it was like okay I got it. Mm -hmm. You know, so a dream is like that. A dream doesn't make any sense rationally. And sometimes you look at a dream and you say, what? <laughs> you know, it's like, doesn't make any sense at all. But if you put the work into it, amplify each symbol, give that voice to each symbol, allow the symbol to talk to you, let the light come on and then go to the next, next, and next, 
And then you start seeing the story and then you go, whoa. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. So, so the unconscious is limited by, rational, by rational thinking. Mm -hmm. It is symbolic in its pure essence. And so we have to learn. And, and why we're learning this, and it's interesting, you know, because we talk about this and then we want to take that same kind of thinking and we want to apply that to astronomy, you know, so that you allow the symbol to get, you know, so, 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 you know, oh, you have Mercury and Gemini. Well, I don't, you know, I don't care what I think as an astrologer. What, how are you living? So then you amplify, mm -hmm. and then you free associate till the person understands the role of their Mercury in their own chart. Mm -hmm. It's a much different way of looking at the chart than from a point where I know what it is, and here's, this is it. Or you go down, you become dialectic, and you use free association, amplification. So that's why we go through this whole process of learning to work with dreams, and then throughout the workshop series, we work with our dreams, and as we integrate the astrology, then all of a sudden we find out that the dreams, my dreams and my astrology are saying the same thing, and now I have two really powerful guides for my practice. Mm -hmm. And that's what the, the, the healer and the dreamer is about, mm -hmm. is introducing you and developing those kind of skills. Mm -hmm. Okay, questions? Yeah. So... In your dream, in a dream, if you die and you leave your body, which I have, um, <laughs> I walked around the hallways and uh, looking for another body. There's this real cute blonde, and I thought, oh, I don't want to be a blonde. Um, and I went back into my body. Oh, this feels better. So it's it's death, but yet it wasn't uh, morbid in any way. It was kind of happy and light. So let's take that dream, okay? So so if you're playing the role of a dream analyst, so the person shares the dream, you write it down. And then you go back to the dream, and you start with this first symbol. So you, de you died. Yeah, and I what? don't know how or... Okay, yeah. so if you amplify that, what is that saying? What is dying? Dead. Dead? Yeah, what is dead? So free your soul, so what does that mean? What is the unconscious trying to say to you? Yeah, good question. <laughs> That's, so now we're starting to work with the symbol. Yeah. There. Where you're going. So what is death? Release. Release. The end. The end. Or the beginning. But it's also the beginning <laughs> oh, the of beginning. something Change. new. No responsibility. What did you say? Change. 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 Letting go. You, there's part of you that's dying, mm -hmm. you know, and death, there's always rebirth, you know, and so you're dying, but you're still moving around. So then that experience of death would announce that there's a deep transformation going on in you. Some part of you is dying, right? So at that time, there was probably some dying going on, right? And so then, so then, does that make sense? Yeah, and then I watched my soul come up out of my body, go down the hallway looking for the... So what is the, what, is, what is the soul coming out of your body and going down the hallway? Yeah. Free, what is that saying? There's a message there. Sure. Well, you're letting go of your old definition... Right. And your soul Look, is looking for a new definition. Exactly, the soul is, the soul the is soul and he's going is, down the hallway. But it doesn't like what it finds. It's going down the hallway and decides not. That's not for me. Back I go into this body. So what? What is that saying? Acceptance. Well, or Fear. that there's an you know there is you 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 know so who you know so this blonde, what does she represent? She was a friend. She was a friend. And tell us more about it for her. Oh, we were friends. And she was very blonde, blue eyes. And, uh, and she liked the way she looked. And I, so when I went... So, 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 so take that symbol. Always yeah. get the symbol and fully understand what that symbol. So what does she represent in your process? 
But did she represent, um, well, do I want to be like that? Exactly. Do so I you want to be like that? Or, or <laughs> there's something about her that you don't want to be like. Oh, yeah. Oh, definitely. <laughs> okay. Okay. And, but she, she, you know, again, she is part of you. So there's a part of you that kind of, you know, kind of idealizes her or there's a part of you that is like her that you don't want any part. So then all of a sudden the dream saying that this identification with this part that's dying and you don't want that. Does that make yeah. sense? Yeah. So you saw how we work with that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's how you work with a dream. You look at what the dream is saying about your own process. Now, as you grow with dreams, then dreams will be prophetic. You know, and, and they will also be personal. And sometimes they'll be both. Where they're announcing some profound change in the collective and in myself as well. So then working with a dream, and like this dream that I talked about in, in, in the boat and all of that, it, you know, I work with this dream and told that dream in lectures. I told uh, that dream to friends. I kept working on it. And not till after three weeks of working with the dream, finally talking with someone else, oh, I need to take to the airwaves. You know, and so you keep working with a dream. You keep working with a dream, like the dream that you were mentioning. So, you had this dream, and we'll, I'll let you guys work with it, okay? I'm just going to tell you the dream, and you guys play an analyst. Okay? So, here's the dream. And Jung had this when he was four years old. <laughs> and he's walking in his backyard. And he sees a trap door on the ground. He opens the back door, the, the trap door, and he sees the stairs. He goes down the stairs, comes to a rich brocade curtain, green. Opens it, sees a red rug and this beautiful temple altar. You know, like a dome, very ornate. And then he sees on the throne sees this big, massive, look like a tree almost, but it's kind of, and then it's got an eye on top and it's gonna light on it. Then he hears his mother, take a really good look at him. That's the man eater. And that's the dream. <laughs> okay, so you be the analyst. Who wants to go? Well, to me, when you go down the stairs, you're going into your subconscious. The unconscious, yes, right. perfect. You're going down to figure something else that's in your unconscious, right? You're, yes. Um, it's a very earthy dream to me because there's he goes into the earth, which could represent his mother, too. Mm-hmm, um, beautiful. The green curtain represents healing and earth to me. Yes, yes. Um, the, the, the curtain is identified it's, as it's, nature. It's, yeah, that's how mm. I took it. It's very earthy and motherly. and um, I haven't quite figured out the rest yet, but so far, to me, he's going yeah. into subconscious maybe for some healing, some healing work that he needs to do with regards to his mother or um, the rich or past life. Mm, yes. So he had this dream when he was four years old mm -hmm. and it took him his whole life. To talk about it, he didn't talk about it till he was 65. <laughs> didn't understand it till he was 65, but it announced his whole journey. So his whole okay. journey, his whole life is going into the unconscious. Right. <laughs> and so, what is that beautiful ornate room? Like, and a throne. So. And a throne. It's like mastering something? Would it be mastery over? Would it represent, depends what a throne represents to you. Well, well see, if you right. look at it and you're descending into the unconscious, mm -hmm. the kingdom, and there's a beautiful temple mm -hmm. with a phallic deity. Mm -hmm. So you realize that was a penis, man. <laughs> you know, that's a penis. That, it it, it was mind. a penis and it was huge. Okay? <laughs> okay. And it was lit. 
Okay? So, so then, then we're right out of a temple in India mm-hmm. with the Shiva Lingam. Mm-hmm. You know? And so then we're talking about, you know, huge symbolism of fertility, of mm-hmm. understanding nature. We're in the womb of the yeah. mother. Mm-hmm. We're in a temple. All the things that he had to do. Now, what is about this man-eater thing? Mm. Like this is the yeah, like his kind of thing that can swallow or... up your life if you're not careful. Mm-hmm. So you have to. So that's why you have to understand the person, and you have to understand the mythology surrounding that person. Right. Okay. So mm-hmm. when he was growing up, his parents, and in Switzerland. Jesuit monks were forbidden mm. and and he saw one one time and he identified Jesus and the, uh, the, 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 the Jesuit monk as the people that dealt with those people that were buried in the ground mm. that were dying mm. so for him, the man eater was God. Was this man, this 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 ambivalent creature, this God that 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 buried people? That you know, this whole death thing, you know, and and you know, this is a four-year-old boy again, you know, mm-hmm. and 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 so so then to him, that was God. So here's the man eater. You know, and the man eater was, you know, he, he saw his father burying people into the ground, mm-hmm. you know, and, and doing the ceremony. And he identified that one Jesuit that he saw one time and he was terrified. Mm-hmm. And so then, so then the man eater is the mystery of God. And that's God there. Mm-hmm. So then, you, you know, so understanding the person and understanding the context. So that's why questioning the person, you know, so here's, you know, if Jung was there and you're analyzing his dream, so you free associating, mm-hmm. you know, what's, what's the man eater? Well, I identify the man eater, you know, and he talks about it in, in, in memories, dreams and reflections. He says, you know, that was my identification with mm-hmm. this process of death and this process of the Jesuit priest. And so in that way, monk, and so in that way, you know, through the free association and allowing, you know, I can insist on my own, my own understanding, but I want my, you know, the person that I'm working for with, I want them to tell me what they feel. So then that's why the free association is so important. Mm-hmm. <laughs> what a way to look at God. Was that? <laughs> what a way to look at God, the man eater. <laughs> well, it's for a four mom. year old boy <laughs> yeah. who saw his father burying people, yeah. you know, so it's like, oh, wow. Well, and they're all religious and they're all praying and they're burying these guys. And here's this black, this, you know, this robe. And that's the man eater. He was terrified and he couldn't talk about his parents with, do with that. Yeah. <laughs> so he carried that through his whole life. Yeah. And it was really basically his whole life journey announced to him in his first dream. Mm -hmm. But it could be interpreted so many different ways. Yes. Based on your own individual. And all all of those are valid as well. Yeah. And that's the active imagination. That's the free association. That's the rich. Symbology. Like even symbology. You know, a phallic symbol. Exactly. Yeah. It, you know, his power, you know, mm-hmm. so his life work was to define what that Shakti is, what that mm-hmm. power, you know, the difference, you know, so, so many. Yeah. Yes. Did, did you ever touch in on night terrors and sleepwalking? Mm-hmm. No. Like that? Oh, yes. Some somnambulism, and yes. And um, yes, and then I uh, had many clients like that who, who went through that kind of thing. Uh, and, uh, you know, night terror, it, it, you know... Easily, for someone who is deeply disassociated with his unconscious, the, the dream world will rise up to create a state of psychosis in the dream time 
to get the attention that, hey man, you need to get some help. Okay. You know, and so then the symbolism, I've worked with a client who came to me, who she had night terror all her life. And she came to me and, and, we, and, and we started talking about these dreams. And over a period of six months, her whole dream, and, you know, work completely shifted. Liz Green also tells the story of a similar, um, uh, in the, the astrology of fate. She, she goes with the chart of a person and she goes with their dreams and how the person, so, so, so you may have a, 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 a terrifying dream of a, of a creature coming out of, um, she describes this dream where, um, where you got this creature and she's in a house in renovation and she's walking on the plank and this creature comes out of the dark water and she's terrified and wakes up in cold sweat. You know, so then, you know, so then you take that through free, you know, symbolism, you know, the house is in disrepair and repair. Mm -hmm. What does the house symbolize? Safety, security, your home, your shelter, your... Yourself. Your sanctuary. Oh yeah, your soul. It's in repair. Mm -hmm. you are got some problems. Mm -hmm. And then the dark person is coming out. Who's the dark person? Shadow. Shadow side. Wanting to be integrated. So, <laughs> see, so, so then Liz Green says, okay, you know, this person, invite him for dinner. Talk to him. Mm -hmm. And so then she described other dreams where he was knocking at the door, bearing down the door. And then finally he came in and then he showed up the next one where he was ferrying a boat across the water and he'd become a friend. And then she looked at his face and it was the, fa the face of her father, mm -hmm. you know, and then boom, from that dream analysis, she healed her, her, her neurosis and realized, you know, the whole relationship with the masculine had been all because of her trauma with her dad, and now the dad had become a friend, and he was ferrying her across the, the, the you know, the, the, the river. Mm -hmm. And so in that way, whenever we have really, really, and that's the effect, you know, and if we keep saying, no, I don't want to listen to you, the dreams get, keep getting stronger, or else you become completely dissociated, or you go crazy. That's, see, Jung says that in a neurosis, in a psychosis, it's the soul wanting to be integrated. And if you deny that integration, if you deny that process, mm -hmm. then it's only going to make the shadow stronger to the point where it becomes night terror. Yes? Um, I just, it, the reason I ask is because last summer I ran into someone I haven't seen in years, ever since I was little. She used to babysit me. And I haven't seen her since I was like, I don't know, very young. And she said, we just started talking and she said to me, oh yeah, you know, it was really hard actually looking after you, Jasmine, because I'd put you to bed and then two hours later you'd wake up and start walking around with your eyes open. Like I would sleepwalk. And then she said that I would tell her I'd have night terror. So I mean more specifically, does, is there anything that I can read that Young's got on like children? Well, did you know, you like, you remember that dream that we did the last time we went through this and we talked about the green shoes? Yeah. Well, that's that material. That's that little girl. And, you know, those, you know, and all that, that work that you've been doing. And so you would really benefit from looking at these dreams as a manifestation. See, uh, yes, actually, in the development of personality, Jung talks about childhood dreams. And he says that when you're a child, you're dreaming the, the parents' dreams. You're dreaming the psychological atmosphere in the home. Mm -hmm. So at that time, in your home... In My mom never told me that I sleepwalked. It's ever. I That's never heard wild. it before, ever. <laughs> and I just found a last summer with my babysitter that I haven't seen. And... and it's just, I went online to look it up, sleepwalking, night terrors for children, and they, there's nothing. 
They say nothing. Oh, it happens the, between the, the age of blah, blah, blah. The development of personality. He talks about it. In the, he, he talks about children and their issues. Beautiful, beautiful book. Okay. I have it in my collection. Okay. You can check it out. I'll show you a couple of essays to read. what age do, does a child take on this psychology of the parents in, in the dreams? Well... Utero? <laughs> in, 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 you know, for the first two years, whatever happens in the fa in in the family, especially with the mother, whatever happens to the mother first happens to the years. child. In the first two years, the ego of the child is not developed not enough, developed. Yeah. and so whatever happens to the mother, if the mother is really stressed out, cool. if she's getting all kinds of abuse, or if she, you know, if she's insecure. She will hold on to the child really tight, and she will transfer all of that trauma to her child. Oh, yeah. Don't like that. <laughs> well, that stuff is ancestral because that's probably how she was taken care of. Yeah. You know, and though, and then you can see that in the chart too. You know, like a moon, you know, moon Pluto conjunction, moon Pluto aspect. The, the mother is usually possessed or by ancestral rage. She's living ancestral rage. She's living a story that's ancestral and she's passing it on to you. And you're getting to live that. And, and it's incredible to look at, in Astrology of Fate, Liz Green talks about, she does a whole family's chart and she looks at that, you know, ancestral rage in all of the different charts. Grandmother, you know, daughter, you know, uh, 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 granddaughter, you know, grandmother, mother, yeah. two daughters, father, grandfather, you know, she looks at it and she sees and she traces it all back. In my astrology table, I've done four generations on the table at the same time. I have different sets of planets. I can do 11 charts at a time. So we did a, a family constellation. And then you can see the patterns and the ancestral stuff being passed down. So if somebody has, a, you know, so so then then the dream and the astrology together become such a powerful tool for healing and for psychological analysis. Just by knowing that, you come into healing. Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. I did a reading yesterday with a lady where she just, you know, kept repeating the ancestral story instead of realizing that man. You've been so courageous, and through your whole process, your whole life, you're redeeming your ancestral line. Mm -hmm. And by changing the story and rewriting the story, she left with so much more confidence, understanding that the negative voice is just an ancestral voice. It's the voice of her mother when she was a child. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Is it possible that the ego is just a, bunch, it's just a, a whole collection of ancestral voices? Well, I think that um, not only the ego, but also the soul. Mm -hmm. I mean, the thing is that, that, that... incessant chatter in your mind is just a collection of ancestral voices. The, it's mixed in with a bit of survival, like, you know, the basic ego, you know, root of what the ego will, you know, try to have live in you. But basically. Could it be a collection of... What kind of ego we're talking about, because that word has many, many different... Mm -hmm. Well, the id and the ego, like, like... Are we talking I'm about, talking about Freudian like... Freudian ego, or...? Freudian ego... Yeah. Well, let's let's talk about Jungian ego, and we'll, this is okay. the workshop That's next week. This is the workshop next week, mm -hmm. Individuation and Quest for Self-Realization. We do five mandalas, and we explain all these concepts in depth. But, but basically, the ego, or, or what we call the ego, Jung calls it, um, he calls it, what does he call it? What's the word for it? He calls it... Uh, uh, the persona. Mm, the persona. The persona, and persona in Greek means mask. Mm -hmm. So it's the mask mm -hmm. that I put on for mm -hmm. everybody to see. Mm -hmm. And then as I become, you know, and that's ancestral completely. My family, my collective, the education I go through puts this mask on me. This is who I am, you know, and, you know, I'm Catholic, you know, I'm French Canadian. You know, I'm, you know, you know, I'm going to be, you know, whatever I'm programmed with. That's the mask. Mm -hmm. When, when the mask falls off or trauma happens mm -hmm. and I'm realizing, oh, I'm not my mask. I better find out who I am. Mm -hmm. 
Anyway, we're going to go through all that yeah, next week. That's fascinating. Yeah. It's difficult. Identity crisis. <laughs> well, I have a beautiful mandala that I draw, and I'll do that next week. That's part of the, the individuation and the quest for self-realization, where we talk about all of Jung's basic ideas through mandala drawing. It really is talks about that. So, 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 but, but to, you know, Jazzy, to get back to your question, is it the ego? Well, the ego itself is a sense of who I am. And, and, you know, so there's two ways. There's the Freudian id, and then there's the Eastern conception of ego as being a back thing, and I gotta let go of the ego. Jung says you gotta strengthen the ego so that the unconscious doesn't overcome the ego. You gotta strengthen your sense of self so that you can have an objective relationship with the unconscious. And so in the early stage of development, the mask and who you identify with is only made up of all of your ancestral baggage and what you were programmed to become because of that background. Yeah, it's just interesting to me in that I'm strength, you know, in terms of the Jungian sense, I'm strengthening my ego through peeling back the layers and taking off the masks of the ancestral influences so that I can literally become in tune more with my character, my true character, my true nature in this sort of the development space of around me that is in highly influenced. Right. So like... That's the process of individuation, okay. becoming yourself. So, but but you know, so but those so you voices in your head. Where are those from? Those voices in your head are <laughs> ancestral, like you said. Yeah, like it's <laughs> also you pick up from around you. Yeah. You could yeah. yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, it's about notes. it's about understanding. Mm -hmm. You know, so so Jung, Jung says about the process of individuation that it's nothing short than resolving the collective psychosis within yourself. Mm -hmm. yes. So all of these voices, all of this stuff that I identify with and I think that's mine, that are actually collective, that are programmed within me, then you know, I have to resolve all of that, clear all of that up, and emerge as a whole personality, you know, that includes unconscious and conscious, and I become, you know, I become whole as a person, that's nothing short than to heal all my ancestral family. It's, it, that's, what, that's what individuation is, is to take that stuff on and to say, okay, I'm gonna take that shit and I'm gonna make a compost pile and I'm gonna make a beautiful garden out of it. Mm -hmm. yeah, you have to question everything. I have to question everything, but in the same way as we do with a dream, symbolically. You know, in, 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 in something, you know, you know, that, you know, a terrifying personality or somebody that's, you know, caused you great amount of trauma and you're trying to heal that, you need to understand that her, your story is her story too. And that's all she knew to do is to pass on her own story. Yeah. And then you understand, oh, this is ancestral. And so then I can forgive mom, and I can forgive myself, yeah. mm -hmm. and I can, I can make that, and I can become the redeeming. So in essence, all of those things are ancestral, and the process of individuation is to redeem the ancestral line. It's not only that you're becoming different from it, but you're healing it in your well, family. Yeah, I'm trying to remove the blockages so more of the gifts can come through, not the not the burdens and the trauma, like I'm trying to clear. And the act of doing that is freeing your, your ancestors as well. Knowing they were unconscious. Mm -hmm. Well, knowing that they were victims of their times, just yeah, like you're just a victim exactly. of your time. Yeah, and just passes on. I'm really starting to see that. Hallelujah. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, that's kind of the world, world I live in, so it's kind of fun. And, and it's beautiful to have you part of uh, this. But uh, it's interesting how we're going uh, uh, back away from dreams. Um, any, and how are we doing? Because uh, a lot of the things that we talked about today, it's interesting, you know? Because I was thinking, oh, 
And then, and then you guys will see next week the quest for individuation. And I'm thinking, well, maybe I should do the individuation one before the dream one. Mm. <laughs> you know, and, then, and, and, and you know, like, um, like Alan was questioning me today, you know, he says, you don't need to record all of your workshops. It says, well, dude, I do. Because in every workshop, I'm discovering new stuff yes. about this thing. <laughs> you know, so I, I'm putting this... 12 workshop series together, you know, and, and, and it's a work in progress, it's a creative work, and, and, Because uh, it unfolds organically, each time is a little different. It's, yes, and as, the more I do it, the more clear it becomes, and so you'll see individuation as the quest for self realization and maybe it is that I put that one first, and then do dream, and then the philosophical rose, Anyway, it's all coming together. And, you know, tomorrow I'm going to do the same lecture in, in Victoria, and it's going to be completely different. <laughs> you know, and, 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 and I haven't arrived. At, and plus, because I'm very intuitive, and I allow, and I'm not very um, disciplined. Um, um, well, in a sense I am, but in a sense I'm not. Uh, but, uh, um, you know... I allow digressions and regressions and questioning and then we go into tangents and and it's all you know so then each uh, workshop has a has a certain life to it you know and so then you know so I might do you know I mean I've done this one the first time I've done it is is two years ago for the Union Society and I've been doing it and I don't think any one of them has been the same as the other mm -hmm. Plus you and, have different people. Well, and then I'm served with the task of writing a book about it. Then the story keeps changing, and it's like, okay, <laughs> all right, mm -hmm. let's keep going. It's always changing. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. That's the my God that I pray to. I always say, and all your adaptations and newest versions, I'm talking to that too, you know. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. And it's kind of like your dream. Do we want to do another dream? How are we doing on time? 8.40. 8.40. we got 20 more minutes. More dreams? Is this the last slide? No, there's more slides. But it's all more quotes. Mm -hmm. you, want, you guys want to go to quotes? Mm -hmm. What do you guys want? <laughs> go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> um, I had this recurring dream I haven't thought about in maybe years that came up during the class um, when I was a child we moved and I can't unfortunately because I haven't thought about it in years I know I wrote it when I was younger um, I think I had it between the ages of five and seven maybe four I'm pretty sure it's after we moved to BC um, it's just me and my mom at that time and the dream happened for a while every week and then it just kept happening and coming up again every few months at least every year for, I guess it must have been at least four years. And it was about, I'm gonna try to remember as best I can. I remember walking in the woods, these massive, massive trees. And yeah, it must have been before I moved here because these trees are something I'd never experienced in Ontario. It was like these massive trees with the old growth forest now I realize. And as I was walking down, there was nobody else at this park um, or at least the initial version of it, there was no one else at the park. And I was walking with my mom, and there was these big dinosaurs. And this one huge Tyrannosaurus Rex came and started chasing us and started running, and it got my mom and killed her. And I ran, hid somewhere, and started bawling, and I'd always wake up. And then some versions there'd be other people but it would eat everybody but I'd be alive and I'd just be crying and wake up every time <laughs> um, yeah I don't know it's happened so many times when I was a child and so then, so you wanna you wanna you wanna work through that dream sure I think I think I just I think I did but <laughs> you, you think you did so what the, so then then you share with us what do you see as we were doing this class tonight I um at least what I've came to me tonight was that at that age, 
my mother's role shifted from being my mother to being more my mm, uh, sister, partner, confidant, maybe child at times, as well as mother. And I feel like that's what died, and that's what I was grieving. That's, that's beautiful. Mm -hmm. But uh, look at the well, symbolism of the forest. I don't know. What does the forest symbolize? To big, me, it big symbolizes trees. safety. Safety. And home. And when did you, when you were looking at the trees and walking in the forest, what were you feeling? Uh, light and free and held. Okay. So then, then, what else does the forest symbolize? Um, like in fairy tales, or yeah. I guess like getting mm -hmm. lost. Getting lost. What else does it symbolize? Um. In fairy tales, usually the forest is the unconscious, mm. right? You got this city, and then usually the princess gets lost, or you know, or you know, or or you know. So so the the, the you know. So then the forest is usually the unconscious, is the place where light doesn't come in, right? Mm, yeah. So when it's big, big trees, what do the big, big trees imply? To me, they always symbolize like ancient ones, like gods. Ancient ones, so you're in the unconscious, in the, in, in the place of the ancient ones. Oh, for real. Right? Yeah. Does that, okay. uh, you know, so then you're in there with your mother and you're walking and how does it feel at that point? Walking with mom in the forest. Profound, safe. Um, Profound, safe. So you're going through this unconscious and then big dinosaurs show up. <laughs> Scary. <laughs> but what do they represent? Demons. Unconscious content. Yeah. Ancestral content. And they eat your mother up. Yeah. Then you go look for shelter. Yeah. So then at that point, who are those creatures? Society, Christianity, family members. The ancestral rage that ate up your mother. Yeah. And that you're having to deal with. Yeah. So does that make sense? How does that feel? Makes more sense than looking <laughs> quickly. <laughs> yeah. So you see that, uh, you know, at first you think you understand the dream, you know, but you gotta dig. Mm -hmm. You gotta dig. That's, you know, like, like I get people that come with me to me for dream analysis and they think, I think I understand this one. And then, and then they go, oh. <laughs> I didn't. I didn't think you had to go that deep. <laughs> <laughs> and so it's it's to take the symbol, and the free association till you understand what that you know. Like we looked at the trees, we looked at the forest. Mm -hmm. The forest, you know, is the you know once you, you get to the unconscious, it's kind of like you know going in the cave for Jung, right? Mm -hmm. You know, so it announces your journey into the unconscious, and what ate your mother up. Those, you know, those collective ancestral dinosaurs. What are dinosaurs? Ancient. Ancient animals. So really you're dealing, you know, so then when your mother and you are dealing with is stuff that goes way back into the unconscious. And then now you start seeing your mother and that, you know, in a different light. And how, yes, you, you know, you're... You came to redeem that, and you were announced that very early through that repeated dream. Hmm. It just gave me some insight into one of my dreams. Thank you. Just got a mm -hmm. big aha. Uh -huh. Cool. And that—that's the nature of the work. You know, if we have a dialectic approach to it, it transforms me too. Mm. It transforms everybody that works with the material. So that all of a sudden, you know, you, you kind of, in dream analysis, in Jungian dream analysis, we're partners in trying to understand it. And until you understand it, I don't really understand it. Mm -hmm. And if I think I understand it and impose my will on you, 
then it makes the whole thing kind of fun. <laughs> and, and, and as you come with your own understanding of the dream, and you share that understanding, then my job is just to, you know, look at the symbol and amplify them and help you amplify until you start understanding, oh, 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 okay, okay, now I get it, kind of thing, right? That's how you work with dreams. Usually. The objectivity, that detachment, mm -hmm. that dialectic approach, and the freest, and that's what we do when we do active imagination, we do the same thing. It's like, oh, you know, I saw this in my dream, okay? And now you start drawing it, and what was it like, really? Oh, and wow, and oh, 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 oh! <laughs> it becomes a way of working and to giving the unconscious content a voice, and it starts exchanging with me. There starts to be a dialogue. So through dream work, and that's why we talk about eventually it becomes like a spiritual experience. I can't wait till the next dream I'm going to get mm -hmm. because it's going to give me some more. And as I go into my process, my dreams become my guide. Mm -hmm. Powerful stuff. Mm -hmm. Questions? Anything else? We, we, um, more dreams? You want to see some quotes? Sure. How are we doing? More quotes? You want to hit the next slide? Mm -hmm. The symbol, you know, so of my childhood experiences and the violence of the imagery upset me terribly. These were the crucial experiences of my life. It was then that it dawned on me. I must take the responsibility. The responsibility it is up to me how my fate turns out. I had been confronted with a problem of which I had to find an answer. And who posed the problem? Nobody answered me that. I knew mm -hmm. then that I had to find the answer out of my deepest self, that I was alone before God and that God alone asked me these terrible things. That's memory, dreams, and reflections. Next one. You know, so, you know, again, from memories, dreams, and reflections, sense of destiny. So, so Jung was really deeply moved by the experience of his childhood, just like you were deeply moved by your dream. And, 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 and we get these experiences. Hmm. Somebody else wants to read it? I'm going to get a neck ache. <laughs> I can read it. From the beginning, I had a sense of destiny, as though my life was assigned to me by fate and had to be fulfilled. This gave me an inner security, and though I could never prove it to myself, or, and though I could never prove it to myself, it proved itself to me. I was outside time. I belonged to the centuries, and he who then gave me the answer was he who had always been, who had been before my birth. He who always was there, this task with the other were my profoundest experiences. On the one hand, a bloody struggle, on the other, a supreme ecstasy. Mm -hmm. Doesn't that sound like life? But to go back to, <laughs> the, the, to, go back to your question about all these voices that come in, mm -hmm. you know? So I just mean, the, yeah. Go ahead. I just mean the incessant rambling all day long when you catch yourself and you're like, oh God, I just spent the last like one minute like totally like not present with this task that I'm doing right now, actually. That voice, you know, the like, the one that comes in and kind of like tries to like take your mental space on to, to other places other than where you're actually, your focus well, the, is at. The, the mind is very, very unruly. You have to discipline it. It'll, mm -hmm. it'll just keep generating. Yes, Not but stuck. but but what if if that voice that tries to distract you was the voice it was your inner voice and it just needs to be kind of integrated? What if it's the part of you that wants to be integrated? Mm -hmm. 
you know, what about that? that well, mm -hmm. sure, it seems like the total opposite of like the purpose of meditation and the goal to like quiet, yeah, quiet the mind. And like when once you start to like lose track or like fall away, you bring it back to your breath, for example, or like you know about being in the body. Right. I, I don't know. It's just yeah. Go anywhere with this. No, well, I think that that's uh, see, and and you talked about this in um, in his book um, of uh, the secret of the golden flower, mm -hmm. where he talks about Eastern philosophy and this thing about quieting the mind, you know, and letting go of the ego and all of these ideas that come from Eastern philosophy. He says that there's a great danger with those ideas because the Western mind is naturally extroverted and and, and the Eastern mind is naturally introverted. Mm. So that we have a different legacy in that our legacy from from you know from the Greeks on to the Christian era and you know, what would the example of Christ bearing the cross? You know, we we have an extroverted faith. You know, we are we look at spirituality in a much different way than the Eastern minds looks at it. And so when we take Eastern ideas and we try to introvert them uh, you know, we, we actually extrovert them, we try to live them, we try to control the mind, but, we, but, but really, our Western mind needs to be engaged. It needs to, it needs to bear the cross, it needs to... Self-annihilate? Because that's annihilation. The crucifixion is, like, symbolically, it's like, 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 you know, nailing yourself to the cross to a cross to experience pain and stay with it is 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 a symbolic of living through meeting yourself in the moment of of intense pain and and, and, and annihilation and beautiful beautiful so let's let's take this and, and, yeah. let's take this and let's give it a symbolic analysis what is the cross Free associate with the cross, amplify the cross. What is the, the cross? spiritual material plane intersecting? Yes. What else? Paradox, suffering. Paradox, suffering. What else? Where does the cross come from? What is the cross? Wood tree. It's you. It's you at the, in the center. Your yourself. Your true self. It's you on the roads, on the crossroads. It's like that. Thank you. Well, the, the one. It's becoming clearer and clearer that I need to do the individuation workshop. No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the, one, the, one, the one and the two, and then the, the two three. The one is, uh, so the cross yeah. is always right. the combination of the four the elements. Yeah. It's the four directions, That's the four elements. Okay, so then it is, you know, so like every, you know, a lot of the astrological symbol, you know, like yeah. Venus, you got the sun and you got the cross of matter mm -hmm. you know so mm -hmm. from time immemorial the cross means matter the four elements the four directions the four functions so a quaternity and the middle point is is the, is is the, the self. self exactly yeah. so then you got the cross mm -hmm. then you got jesus being nailed to the cross so you got jesus carrying through the marketplace the cross on leading to his crucifixion. What? So what does that symbolize? Well, it's like. Well, it's almost like a flag. Like it's almost like a map. It's the burden that we the all burden. follow in carrying, and and integrating and dealing <laughs> with this fucking material world and this material life. Here's Jesus taking the cross on his back, then he gets nailed to it. You know, it's like a real, you know, real experience, you know, like, like, like the experience that we're having collectively right now, you know, of this collective crisis that's going on. 
that's being nailed to the cross. Right, right. And then on the other side of the annihilation, you find no death. It's an illusion. And then he's resurrected, and then you, it's about the afterlife and so, finding salvation. So then what does Christ symbolize then? Isn't it life like you're getting out to the cross right when you get born? <laughs> until, <laughs> and you go all through life and now to this cross until you pass at the end. Well, yes, but what does Christ symbolize? The that life. Mm -hmm. That life. Yeah, but Jung says in Eon that Christ is a symbol of the self. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's, it's, mm -hmm. my, it's me. Mm -hmm. It's my soul being nailed to the cross and having to be reborn. So, so that whole symbolism is the process of individuation. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Does yeah, that make sense? Yeah, yeah, it's, totally. It's, yeah. It's, it's a message. It's a whole thing. So it's, then, it's then, then our tradition is to live that and to be reborn from that and to become divine. Mm -hmm. Whereas the Eastern thought is to go back into nothingness and become nothing. <laughs> Which, which, in the Eastern, you know, pantheon, in the Eastern, you know, population, and in the reality, is that really, it makes a lot more sense for them to have that kind of, of, of an engagement with spirituality, whereas the Western mind, you know, has... You know, for you know, and and, and well, judgment wise, right. really, when it comes down to it, both merge back in the one. Yeah. But 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 you know, to for us to sit down in a place and to become nothing and to meditate and to go back into and to give up the ego, while the chaos reigns around us, it's not our nature. Our nature is to want to do something about it. To want to bring about a solution to the craziness. Our, our nature is to want to become the change that we want to see in the world. That's mm -hmm. the Western mind. The Western mind wants to be reborn, to resolve the ancestral rage. In almost a theatrical, dramatic way. Not theatrical, but almost in a way that's like... Mm, Violent and bloody. <laughs> I don't know. Well, there you go. There you go. The stab yeah. with the other were, oh. you know, the bloody struggle and the supreme ecstasy. Well, that right. Okay. Yeah. That's the that's the Western tradition. <laughs> it's a bloody fucking you know, <laughs> struggle, <laughs> and it leads to the highest ecstasy, and it's both together. That's so twisted. Mm. Well, it's it's the paradox, you know, and it's the paradox. Is there no escaping it? There's no <laughs> escaping it. No, sorry, there is, because when you find yourself annihilated through the paradox on the other side, you are one with the divine and the sacred marriage can happen. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, so, how do we do it? Well, the point is we take up that challenge and we say, okay, I'm going to bear that cross. And everyone has a different, unique challenge. It's their individual process. Exactly, but in ultimately, she because see, the, both paths will lead to the same thing. Both you know, the extroverted true. path or the introverted mm -hmm. path mm -hmm. is to respect one's nature. See, I never really ever think of it like that. I spent a lot of time thinking, of, you know, reading different Eastern. But don't they choose not but... to suffer? The Eastern not. It's all about making the choice. Right. Not desiring. Mm -hmm. And just. Coming to that, you won't suffer, you know, if you let go. Right. Of all your material well, you handle it with grace. So There's a, you handle it with grace mm. best you can. Mm. Or in, in essence, if you take monastic Christi Christianity, you know, the, the whole monastic tradition of Christianity, and the monastic tradition of the East, very, very similar. Mm. Very, very similar in practices. But, you know, but, but, but what Jung says is that what happens to the Western mind when it takes the Western ideas and externalize them, extrovert them, Eastern? the Eastern, yes, when the Western mind takes the Eastern ideas and extroverts them, 
it creates a sense of of sublimation and inflation. Mm -hmm. Well, the spiritual. When I identify with this stain, you know that I don't care. What's or what? like? What that I don't care? That what? I'm detached? That I'm oh, Eastern? Oh, I wish I didn't care. <laughs> I wish I didn't care, but it creates an inflation and a dissociation. And what happens with that is my unconscious baggage, my cross of matter, rebels against me, and then the shadow becomes really difficult to deal with because it's not being given a voice. Mm. You know, it's, you know, and then Jung talks about Christianity and the denial of evil. Okay? <laughs> the Christianity and the denial of evil is a dissociation, and it's the same thing that happens when I say, I'm going to give up the material world, I'm going to give up evil. That's the same thing that happens with the Eastern mind. So really, in essence, they're the same. But the example of Christ is to say, man, I got to carry that old evil cross. I got to integrate it in me. It's not, you know, it's not just the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, but it's also the devil. It's the four, not the three. You know, so, so, so then that's the whole lesson of alchemy. Mm -hmm. so, so, see, that's the thing about Jung's work that most people don't realize, is that Jung dug so deep into the history of the human mind that he dissected, in, from a scientific perspective, all of these traditions and saw those acting out in people and developed this path of individuation. He says, no, 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 I'm not going to tell you what you're doing, how to do this. You're going to discover yourself by giving the unconscious a voice in your own process. Mm -hmm. And by doing that, you're going to become whole. And my job is not to do it for you by telling you, here, you follow this book. And then you, you know, so, so, you know, Jung, in every way, he looked at, you know, and he, he studied indigenous culture. He studied, you know, went to Africa. You know, you know, and went to India, went to all those places, and and, and then he had dreams, you know. So he when he, and so here's a, a dream that he had when he was in India. He had a dream about the Holy Grail. The Holy Grail kept showing up in his dreams, and then he's in a dream where he's got all of his associates with him, all of his, mm, uh, you know, uh, um academics and all of the people that he's working with and they're on a tour of an island in you know and and they're looking for the grail and they're going through ca mm -hmm. through through castles and then he finds out that the grail is on an island and that there's no way to go there and so he realizes I have to go and at that point he realizes that no my job is not in India my job is to recover the Holy Grail. And it was his wife's passion to understand the legend of the Holy Grail. Mm -hmm. She wrote a beautiful book um, about the legend of the Holy Grail mm -hmm. and what it signifies and what the symbolism of it. And so he didn't want to approach it. But then from that dream, he realized that his was not to be in India and to do that. His was to explore the Western tradition you know, and the whole, you know, the whole myth of the Holy Grail and the whole thing of the route, Knights of the Round Table and a whole Western tradition. It's very symbolic. And we look at it as, the, you know, some medieval stories. But if you dive deep into it, it's profound, mm -hmm. profound, profound, profound stuff. You know, the, you know in, in, the, in, the, in the, the legend of the Holy Grail, mm, uh, uh, Emma Young, um, talks about the round table as being as the you know the you know my my astrology table hmm. and she talks about you know and 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 talks about the symbolism and you know the 12 apostles and you know and then they go into it about you know the holy grail was the 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 cup that Joseph of Arimathea grabbed the blood of Christ and brought it and you know, there's a whole mythology that goes with it, and then it's there in our tarot. It's, you know, it's everywhere, you know. The tarot is the four elements, you know. So here we are in the, we in the Western tradition. And so Jung says, no, no, mine is not to, to understand the Eastern tradition. 
although I'm, you know, I'm here and I'm doing it, I'm checking it out, you know, and, and, you know, and the problem of evil, when he was in India, you know, the problem of evil can come up for him, you know, because in India they work with evil much different, you know, and so he was like really perplexed about it, and then he got his dreams, and then the Holy Grail kept coming up, then he got that dream, and he realized, oh, you know, then he wrote this book called Eon, and Eon is an incredible treatment of the astrological symbolism joined with Christianity in this incredible book. Then he wrote the answer to Job, which takes Christianity to the next level. Mm, and, and, then, and then his uh, alchemical work is incredible. So, so most of anything, Jung was a student of human nature <laughs> and a prolific writer in his library. Oh my God. Yeah. His library was like, whoa, and it's still there, and you can go and visit it, and you can get permission to go in there. Where is it now? In, 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 in Switzerland, in, in, the, in, the, in his house mm. still. It's all museums now. Mm. And so, so, but he always resisted the label of mystic and always wanted to remain objective about his whole thing. But... Uh, but probably uh, e uh, um, the, um, the, the um, uh, answers to Job, and then I'll just tell you a little bit about it because I can't stop, but I'll, I'll close this. In answers to Job, talk, you know, Jung talks about Christianity, and you guys are familiar with the story of Job? Ian could tell us. Is that the one... Uh no, I don't think I am. Wasn't he cursed by God and he killed his family and killed his animals and... Yeah. Set? Okay. It's Old Testament, right. about 400 before Christ. Okay? Oh, so it's the pact with, like... The devil Lucifer made the deal. God the devil came to so God and says, you know, I bet if you test your, 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 your faithful Job, right. you'll break. I bet you'll break. And he threw everything at him. And he threw everything at him, and then Job climbed on the mountain and says, What the fuck, man? I've been doing everything for you. And then he has this argument with God, this you know, fancy discussion with God. And then Yahweh looked at him, and he says, Oh, my servant just showed me up. And so then, then Jung says, at that point, God decided, Okay, I have to become human. I have to go down. I have to experience what he's experiencing because he just became, my servant just became more than I am. He showed me up. He showed me that I, you know, and so then God had to become human at that point to experience what Job had experienced. And, and, and then he says that was the beginning, and then Jung says that was the beginning of the age of Pisces. <laughs> and, and, and then that's a great shift. And then he said that the age of Aquarius that we're becoming now is where we're realizing that God is in each and every one of us mm -hmm. and he's both masculine and feminine, the anthropos. Mm -hmm. And that's the great shift that's going on. That's the kind of stuff Jung wrote about. Do you think that the grail represents the divine feminine? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. It's the great, you know, and then... And then he has, uh, so the companion book to, uh, to the Mysterium Conjunctionis is, uh, um, ah, 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 memory bank. It's called um, <laughs> uh, Aurora Consurgence. <laughs> and it's attributed to St. Thomas of Aquinas. Mm -hmm. uh, and Marie-Louise von Franz translated it as a companion to the Mysterium Conjunctionis. And throughout that book, St. Thomas of Aquinas talks about Sophia mm -hmm. and the wisdom of the, 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 the feminine wisdom of God. Mm -hmm. And then Jung talks about that also in the, um, in, 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 the, in the answers to Job. Anyway, mm -hmm. we digressed and went on the nice little that, that, train. That book that he wrote, like, he was denounced for that, wasn't he? He got so much flack for that. <laughs> he got so much hell for that. Well, he got a lot of hell throughout his career, yeah. you know. 
He, he, he was so innovative and so challenging that he suffered deeply because of it. Yeah. Because it, his ideas, you know, at, at the, you know, he wrote this book, you know, well, he, you know, he said at one point, he said, um, I do this because, uh, you know, there's this change of age going on and it's fucking with everybody. And I do this knowing fully well that the, 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 the chisel of my word barely makes an impression on the hard stone in encounters. Almost as if he was 50, 60, 100 years ahead of his time. And that his work now is more relevant to us than it was to them people at that time. Oh. They didn't get him. And now we're starting, you know, it, it, you know his influence, you know, and, and, and it's easy to idealize him. And, and the more you study him, the more you realize how much of a shadow he had and how much of a jerk and how much of a bourgeois snob he was. Really? He was also humble. He was humble, but he was also impossible to get along with. He oh. chewed out his people. Oh. oh, yeah, he had a huge shadow about him, <laughs> you know, and, and the tension of opposites. He was not, he was not kidding when he said a bloody struggle. It was a bloody struggle, and they were blood all over. You know, they, you know, he couldn't get along with anybody. Oh. All of the male partners that he had, friends, they all ended up fighting with him. <laughs> he was, you know, he was impossible. Mm. He, you know, and, and, and you read some of his biographies. I'm like, I read two more biographies of him this year. And I'm finishing one that's 700 pages long. And, and um, it's interesting, you know, because so many people try to define that man. And, and, and um, so many people have completely, you know, there's some people that talk about his astrology, that talk about all of the mysticism, and then there's some people that talk about all the evil shit he did, and you know, and everybody has a different perspective on him. He was a very complex character, and the more and more you kind of see that the evilness of our time and the spirit of the depths. Um, I think that that's the next quote, actually. Check it out. No, the next one after that. No, back. The years when I was pursuing these images, and everything essential was where it began. No, the one that we just read was the better one. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that bloody struggle. It wasn't easy to be Carl Jung. Mm -hmm. it, it wasn't easy to be mm -hmm. Carl Jung, and it wasn't easy to be with Carl Jung either. I'm glad to hear that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm glad to hear that. He was human. He, he, what, I wonder he was if he could stand himself. Hmm? <laughs> What's that? I just wonder if he could stand himself. He couldn't. Just like he had <laughs> such a hard time with him. And everybody picked on him. I mean, he became world famous, you know? I mean, he, got, he was flying all over the place, receiving honorary degrees. He went to India because in India they wanted to give him honorary degrees. He went, he went to, 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 to the States, they gave him degrees, you know, everywhere that he went, he was honored, you know, he became, you know, he was really, you know, he made the, the front page of, of Time magazine in, in the 50s, you know, he was big, he was really big during his time. He's special. <laughs> special, but conflicted, just like yeah. we are. Did, did he have a scorpionic chart? Uh, I have a, <laughs> what, when we go further along in the, in the in the analysis of astrology, we can pop this chart out, and we'll analyze. You know, when we I got this chart, it. then it's a no. it's a fascinating oh. thing. I was thinking so much. Oh, were you? <laughs> well, you had a moon Pluto conjunction. <laughs> oh.